Thanks for joining me on our uh, Zoom call today to talk about the flaring report that we put out earlier today and have been working on for several months. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this. We have a moderator, uh, Brian is, is running the operation today, and so if you can't hear me or if you are experiencing some issues, you can use the Zoom profile to send us a message. Uh, also, as you have questions, please send them in, text them in, message them in to Brian. And uh, as we get into the program, I'll be taking, taking questions from you. What I'm going to do today is spend the first probably 10 minutes just walking through the report. I won't add much new information, just give some context for what we did and how I landed on the numbers that I landed on, uh, why I drew what small conclusions that I did, and, and specifically why I chose this data. Uh, as I said, I'll probably go 10, 15 minutes. I'll spend the balance of our time answering questions from you, the audience. Uh, first of all, to set this up, and, and this is in the introduction section of the report, uh, why put this out? At the end of the day, most of this is just data. Uh, the challenge with us, with our situation today, is that while flaring has increased a lot in Texas over the last few years and has become, has, has gotten into more scrutiny or become more scrutinized, um, the, the challenge has been to discuss possible remedies or discuss what to do as a state and as an industry without, uh, with, without much data in hand. In other words, there's been a lot of philosophical discussion, but not much discussion with, okay, if we took these steps, what might that mean and what actions or reactions impacts might occur? So my objective here was to introduce new data into the conversation so that we can begin to have more substantive um, ideas and discussions around that data to come up with what we believe would be the best path forward for the state of Texas. Uh, I want to start off with, uh, in page one in the introduction, talking about uh, historical flaring levels. And in fact, if you look at page one, if you assume everybody here has seen the report, uh, the first graph that we show there is the oil production in Texas over the last uh, 45 years, and we show natural gas flaring in Texas during that time. The reason that this graph is instructive is because you look and see that, that in the last 10 years, while flaring levels have gone up, they've gone up relatively proportionately to oil production. Now, a lot of the discussion today is why have flaring levels gone up? Well, if you, if you, if you analyze where increases have come and why they've come, it's due almost entirely to lack of infrastructure for new oil development. Or to put another way, we are, we, oil industry and oil wells need to flare some gas after they've drilled an oil well in order, uh, while they wait on infrastructure, but to continue to produce that oil. Some questions have arisen as to, okay, is, do we need any flaring? Uh, if, you, if you talk to folks in industry, one common, one common issue is, look, we're, we're always gonna need to have access to some flaring, they'll say. Uh, because in order to produce oil safely, when there's an upset condition or during development, we've got to have access to flare some. So I think that the, the, the key points of this report are trying to figure out what level of flaring is appropriate. If we assume, or in my case agree, that there's always going to be some level of flaring to make oil development possible and safe and economical, then what, what level is appropriate? And that's what we'll spend our time discussing more in detail today. Uh, our methodology. Uh, as I went through this, this data, in fact, to give a little more background about me, Ryan, why, why are you spending all your time in data? Well, as most people know, I'm an engineer by background, uh, mechanical engineer out of Texas A&M, 20 years in the oil and gas business. And most of my time in the energy space in engineering was spent in data analysis, risk analysis. This is actually kind of my wheelhouse. And so as a few months ago, as we really started to, to discuss it, both at the industry level, as a state, environmental groups, um, community organizations, as, as people were talking more and more about flaring, uh, I wanted to understand, well, what does the data tell us? And so we spent a few months um, exploring this, trying to figure out what data was really relevant, what data was not, and how to look at that data in a way that was meaningful. And so a lot of this uh, analysis I performed myself to, to, in fact, all of it basically, uh, to try to arrive at meaningful conclusions. And so in this methodology, the first thing I, I wanted to do was figure out what is a meaningful way to talk about flaring? Yes, we've been talking as a state and as an industry, even, even internationally, about total flaring volumes. And flaring volumes in Texas have climbed, as I said in, uh, on page one in the introduction, looking at graph one. Uh, today, we estimate that Texas is flaring as much as 650,000 MSCFs per day. And that's more than we've seen in a long time in this state. 
However, is total fluttering volume a meaningful metric? I don't think that it is. And so as we, as we went through the analysis, the methodology was to try to figure out what is a meaningful metric around flaring. And going back to the fact that flaring is most often triggered or more often related to oil production and lack of connection to infrastructure, it seemed that the relationship between oil production and gas flaring was really the metric or really the measure that seemed to be the most instructive. Uh, in this report, I not only worked through establishing uh, what a meaningful benchmark might be, but also looked on an operator-specific level. And all the data in this report is publicly available. Anybody could request this data from the Railroad Commission, get reports, and then put the data together into spreadsheets like I did, uh, and then run the same analyses. I just did the legwork to do it. And in fact, my spreadsheet that I used to do this analysis is on our website as well. So if you want to see the raw data uh, that I got that put into the spreadsheet and then all of my concluding, um, concluding sheets and the analysis I ran, those are all in the spreadsheet you can find on the website. Uh, back to it, looking at data, we started with, okay, well, if, if, if gas to oil ratio, the amount flared to oil production is the key metric, then we have to establish what we call that metric. And I refer to it here, define the term flaring intensity. So flaring intensity is the level of gas an, an operator flares in a given period of time over the amount of oil that they produce in that period of time. And so the ratio is M scuffs flared to barrels of oil produced. Um, the, the information that we looked at to get this data, when we looked at both an international level, uh, a regional level, a state level, and then of course in the state of Texas, we pulled data from the Energy Information Agency and from the Railroad Commission of Texas. Uh, we looked also at other some statistical websites, uh, which are all referenced in the report. Uh, as, we worked, as I worked through to establish the first set of benchmarks, what I wanted to do was first understand where does Texas lie with respect to the rest of the world? In other words, it's easy to say Texas flaring levels have gone up, but also our oil production has gone up more than anywhere else in the world. So what is it, how does that relate to other areas of the world? Well, in table two on page five of the report, I went through and looked at different nations and specifically Iran, Iraq, North Dakota, Russia, the rest of the United States, Texas and Saudi Arabia. And obviously North Dakota is not a nation, but looked at, looked at other areas and how they are currently performing in terms of flaring intensity, i.e. the amount of gas that they flare versus the amount of oil that they produce. And I found this to be really interesting. In fact, I would tell you, I didn't realize how far below most of the world Texas is already, uh, already flaring. In other words, flaring levels in Texas are below levels around the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world when you look at oil production. And so when I tried to use this to establish a meaningful metric, I said, well, if I use the world average as a metric, Texas is already well below that. Uh, and in fact, looking at historical flaring intensity levels in Texas alone, if you look at historical levels, Texas was actually much higher in flaring intensity in history. The graph on page five shows Texas flaring intensity or the amount of gas that Texas flared relative to its oil production. And in the 19 30s and the 1950s, even through the 1960s, uh, the, the flaring intensity levels in Texas were higher than they are today. Brian is pulling up the, the table for us. There's the table of, of flaring levels, or sorry, flaring intensity levels by region or by nation. And Brian, if you'll go to graph two uh, on the next page, I can talk to that graph as well. So this graph shows that oil, that, that flaring intensity levels historically in Texas uh, actually have been higher than they are today. Now in the last uh, 30 years, flooring intensity levels have begun to climb. And this is due, as I've said before, to the rapid development of oil and the lack of infrastructure to capture that gas. But uh, still, relative to the rest of the world, relative to historical levels, uh, Texas flaring intensity is, is, has been on the low side. All right, so let's talk about what the results of of our analysis were, and I'll get into how we arrived at the metric that I used for those results. Uh, Brian, if you scroll down, in the analysis results, the first table I show here is the top operators by the amount that they actually flare. However, I will tell you that this, this, the reason I show this is because if someone was using total flaring volume as the metric, which is what has driven the urgency in Texas, what you'll find is that this would be the appropriate graph, the appropriate table to look at but it's not because some of the operators on this graph are actually some of the highest performers in terms of, of flaring levels or flaring intensity 
their level of flaring per their oil production is actually on is actually below average. So recognize that this table really is not that instructive. We go on to the next one, which is on page seven, table four. This is now the list of operators by flaring intensity or listed by the ratio of the amount that they flare to the oil that they produce. Now you say that some of, some of the operators in this list have a very high flaring intensity at the top of the list at 2.93. However, when you look at this list, you'll find that most of these operators have very low oil volumes and flaring volumes. So once again, while this ratio is instructive, the challenge is that even if most of these operators made some pretty dramatic investments to capture all their gas, the amount of actual flaring that would be reduced is relatively small. So this again, doesn't tell us any, doesn't give us the best information. Well, before we, in order to understand, well, how do we, how do we select the metric and how do we identify which, you know, what, what volumes or what, what flaring intensity levels really tell us about, about total volumes of flaring, I go back to this idea of a metric. And to establish a metric, I looked at the top 150 operators in the state of Texas by oil production. And uh, in fact, Brian, if you will, in a second, get ready to go to graph three on page eight, but give me just a minute. I looked at the top, the top 150 producers, not by operator, but by volume. In other words, look at the total amount of oil production per the top 150 operators and look at the total amount of flaring volume for those top 150 operators. And so we divide that flaring volume by that amount of oil produced. And the average in that case was a flaring intensity level of 0.1 M scuffs per barrel. So this now is, I don't need to do any interpretation. This is just the average amongst the top 150 operators when calculated by volume. And in fact, graph three on page eight shows the scatter distribution of all of the, of all of the operators, not just top 150, around that average level. And so this, by looking at this in this, in this graphic form, we can see that, okay, there's a pretty good distribution around that average, some on the very low side. So the people to the bottom right of the graph are well below the average in terms of flaring levels per oil produced. The ones on the upper right are above the average. So going forward, I used this 0.1 M scuffs per barrel as the, as the benchmark. Now, some of our discussion will be whether or not that's the right benchmark or not, but for the purpose of our discussion here, let's use that one and now, Let's assume, or using that benchmark, let's establish if every if if I were to establish someone's target flaring volume or benchmark flaring volume using that ratio, we can now figure out who in the state or which operators are producing well are, are flaring well above that, and which operators are flaring well below that. And that is the table on the table five on the top of page nine. So I think that this table is probably the most instructive because it helps us understand, you know, what 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 different practices are going on that might result in some operators uh, resulting in higher flaring levels per their target benchmark. Now, keep in mind, not all of these operators are in the same situation. Some are in very different geographies and geologies. Some have higher gas ratios per the amount of oil that they produce coming out of their wells. As I said, some are different geographies where the infrastructure is not built out yet. So let's not jump to the conclusion that this one metric is a universally good benchmark, but still it enables us to start to evaluate if everybody in the state was to try to target or try to shoot for a certain benchmark, where might big reductions come from? And that's what this table tells us. It's also good at this point to point out some, some of the operators who have the lowest flaring volumes in relationship to their targets. And that's what table six tells us. So table six is a, is a list of operators by the lowest amount below their benchmark flaring volume. And some of these are well below. So have they simply invested in more infrastructure? Are they in an area that has more standard infrastructure built in? These are the questions that we can now ask having access to this data. The last section of the report talks about options. There's been a lot of discussion around, well, what could we do to reduce flaring? And I wanted to, to try to unpack a little of this so we have some, some idea of what impacts might be, if I'm watching my time here while we're talking, what impacts might be if we took certain actions. Uh, first, I explore the idea that 
we're already using today, which is wait for anticipated infrastructure. There's been two major pipelines that have come online in the last, or two major pipelines, one that came online the end of uh, last year, one that's targeted to come online into this year, early next year. Both of these lines carry over 2 billion cubic feet a day. And, as, and in addition to that, new gathering systems are built all the time. I'll let you read the specifics in here about the timeframes we're assuming, but we expect that our, our anticipation is over the next 12 to 18 months, based on current construction levels, new flaring levels that are coming, new wells are being drilled, that somewhere between 50,000 to 150,000 MSCUFs per day, uh, uh, we'll see a decrease of 50,000 to 150,000 MSCUFs per day. I know it's a wide range as, as new infrastructure comes online, but still that's anywhere from 12 to 18 months away. Okay, well, let's explore the idea of simply requiring people to, to no longer flare. If I went out today and said, you know what, uh, let's start with the highest intensity the, the operators with the highest flaring intensity or the most amount of flaring per barrel of oil and said you can no longer flare then that would be that would have the that would allow for the greatest reduction in flaring with the least impact to oil and so we did some analysis and said let's pick all those flaring uh, all, all of those top operators in terms of flaring intensity and start adding them up until you get to 200,000 mscuffs per day and the minimum amount of oil that would have to come online if we forced them not to flare today would be 430,000 barrels per day. However, this is based on the assumption that only those specific leases and only those reports can be isolated, which is probably a, a, a pretty aggressive assumption. Uh, in fact, as, we, as, we, as I did some, some analysis in terms of what realistically, if I said, as of today, I'm going to shut down 200,000 MSCUFs per day of flaring, what would the actual reduction in oil production be? Today, I estimate it to be between 750,000 and a million barrels a day to get 200,000 MSCUFs per day of flaring off the market. Now, what does this mean in terms of to, to the rest of the state? Okay, so we lose a million barrels today. Well, this is roughly 1% of global oil production. And when you look historically, I mean, talking back for the last 50, 60 years, when 1% of global oil production has come off the market, then Generally speaking, you see a 40% or a $25 per barrel, depending on which, which time you're talking about, increase in the price of oil, which correlates to roughly a dollar per gallon price of gasoline increase. So if today we're at you know, roughly $50 a barrel and $2 and change for a gallon of gas, if you saw that that went up to $75 a barrel and roughly $3 and change for a gallon of gas, that would be the price impacts to the state of Texas uh, based on historical trends. That's a pretty steep increase. I think that we, we need to be careful if we're going to talk about a relatively uh, short-term or, or dramatic uh, immediate shift to something like that. The next solution I explore is trying to do something more international. Uh, as I reported earlier in the report, you know, Iraq and Iran currently have flaring intensity levels of 0 0.36, 0 0.37. So you're talking about 360,000 MSCUFs per day for every million barrels of oil produced. This is, you know, four times the level in Texas. Well, look, if as a, if as a, a globe, if you talk about especially, especially other you know, international partners, we're really trying to reduce flaring, that's the easiest place to make an impact. And with big, big purchasers of oil from those nations like China and India, while we have no regulatory capacity to force those countries to do anything, buying power is a different story. And so those purchasers could, could define that they expect lower levels of flaring in order to purchase that oil. And that, that has an impact, whereas we can't force them from a regulatory perspective to do anything. I also mentioned that OPEC could do something. To give credit to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has, has invested a lot of money to try to capture their gas. Now, Saudi Arabia, most of their big oil fields are what we call water flood fields, which produce very little gas relative to oil. In fact, if you look up news stories about Saudi Arabia, they want more gas uh, for the things that they have in their country. So they've tried to capture every bit of gas because they need it. In other words, the market demands it, whereas we don't have the market demand for gas here. But still, if there's that much demand for gas in the area, why not, uh, why not have the Saudis as the, or ask the Saudis as the leaders of OPEC to drive higher expectations in terms of flaring intensity for other OPEC member nations. Seems like if we're really trying as a, as a, as a planet to reduce flaring, that'd be the lowest hanging fruit. Finally, and this is more of a philosophical uh, idea, is what if the Railroad Commission implemented some sort of uh, flaring benchmark in our regulation? It would take a lot of action to do this. We could work through the legislature to implement statutory changes and evaluate regulatory changes on our own. But once again, if we, if, I guess the question would be, is it 
is it fair or is it, it, it do the people of this state really wants us to implement a standard or hold Texas operators to a standard that is higher than most of the rest of the world and the rest of the nation. Uh, because if we implement a standard like this and require initial investment, speculative investment in natural gas infrastructure prior to oil wells being drilled in some instances, that's gonna raise the cost of oil development a lot, which will both take some oil off the market, raise the price of oil and shift some investment in new oil development to other areas of the world, some of which have flaring levels higher than ours. So I'm not advocating for or against this measure, but simply understanding that, that moves that we make here in Texas may disadvantage uh, Texas-based investment, and we should be aware of that. Let me conclude this report with this. If there's anything that, that these numbers tell us is we cannot evaluate Texas in a vacuum. You cannot look at simply Texas flaring volumes and say, oh, we have to do something there because almost anything we do has ramifications beyond just the state and even beyond just the nation. It could have international ramifications. In fact, uh, going back to an idea of shutting down a certain amount of flaring in Texas today, I submit to you that if, we, if, I, if I and the other railroad commissioners went out and said, we're going to simply do away with flaring at, at 200,000 MSCUS per day of flaring, a million barrels a day may come off the market. Well, that million barrels a day is going to come from somewhere. And if it comes from countries whose flaring levels or flaring intensity is higher than, higher than ours, then the global flaring level actually goes up while we work to reduce it here at home. So go back to this idea, we can't look at Texas in a vacuum, hence this flaring intensity is a meaningful metric. That if we can look at flaring intensity levels around the globe, certain regions, certain geologies, certain geographies, then we can begin to understand how can we drive things, lead things here in Texas that actually inspire lower flaring levels uh, while not causing undue negative consequences. Look, I'll be the first to say, and everybody I know in industry agrees, we want to reduce flaring. There's a, there's a, lot, of com there's a lot of value in this gas long term. Today, it's not valuable at all. In fact, you could argue it's a waste product. But in the long haul, we'd like to capture this gas and reduce, reduce waste, reduce flaring levels. Everyone agrees on that. The question is, how do we do it? And the purpose of this report was to generate the data that will drive substantive discussions so we can figure out the best way to do exactly that. All right. With that, I'll take questions. Uh, Brian, what do we have? I think we can also allow people to just come on. Uh, if you have a question, let us know. We can let you come on and ask your question live as well. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, what are the system checks the RRC uses to vet operator reported data? What's the confidence level in the modern data relative to using historical data? Yeah. Uh, the good question is, look, what, what are our, what's our confidence in this data? In the end, there's a, there's a natural check and balance outside the Railroad Commission, which is mineral owners. Uh, mineral owners get paid or get reports based on what the operator is producing. And so if mineral owners don't think that they're being treated fairly or that their minerals are being reported fairly, then they've got a big incentive to come to us and ask us to investigate or to go to the operator and ask them to produce uh, their records and how they came up with these numbers. And the, the, the equipment that operators use to, to report this data, report flaring levels, sometimes it's estimated, but usually it's, it's, these are orifice meters, fairly accurate devices that, act, that, that tell them these numbers. Now, I mentioned somewhere in the report that the, railroad, the way the Railroad Commission gathers data is on a historical reported perspective. So while current industry numbers are, are for example, by the EIA are modeled, in other words, they're not based on actual reported data, they're based on on some reported data, but then modeled for, for additional inputs, our data is entirely reported. So therefore our data lags, lags as much as, as a year, as people turn in additional production reports and, and um, additional reports, any kind of particular production reports and flaring reports. So, um, so I believe our data is accurate. The issue is it's timeliness. So in this report, we're average, we were looking at data from the, from the end of 2008 to the you know, October, November of 2000, uh, sorry, 2018, 2019. Uh, so some of that data may be updated as we do new reports. And I'll be updating our reports as, uh, quarterly to give people updated data. Once again, I believe the data is accurate because there are, there's a built-in check to do that. And our, and our staff does, as we go through flaring permits, review the way, review the data that's given to us and the cases for flaring permits. But, um, but anyway, the, the, the issue, is, I believe our data is accurate, the more the question is timeliness. And I think we'll see that play out over time as we run this report regularly and quarterly. 
Plus, Operators have shown hesitance to sign up for additional firm transport capacity from the basin, given that pipeline tariffs are well in the money. Does the RFC have a role in supporting new infrastructure development, giving both environmental and economic benefits? Uh, th there's a kind of a, a supposition in that question. If you can hear the question, the question was, uh, the operators have shown a hesitancy to sign up for new firm capacity. Uh, I don't, I actually hear things to the contrary. I'm sure some, some operators are being hesitant with if, uh, if the pipeline company or midstream company is asking for exorbitant rates. But in general, what I hear from operators is that they are anxiously trying to sign contracts for new capacity. So I, I'm not, I can't speak to that supposition. The following question was, will the Railroad Commission have a role in, um, in driving or, or incentivizing new infrastructure, uh, new construction for new gas capacity? Uh, not from a construction perspective, but look, the, what I'm doing right now actually is, is that role, is to report data, to try to inform where are there opportunities to improve, and then as industry and as the, as the people of this state look and say, what things do we demand? For example, if we were to begin to implement a, a, a measure like a flaring intensity benchmark, then that would drive some additional incentive for people to try to negotiate or try to, to plan for new infrastructure ahead of time. Put it this way, that's one of the outputs of this process. We'll be looking at this data and trying to figure out, is there a way for us to add some incentive uh, that won't have a detrimental impact? Question from Asher Price, Austin American Statesman. Why did you want to undertake this report now as opposed to, say, last year? Well, as a matter of fact, we started this report last year. You know, um, to tell them myself, what, at the end, of, at middle of last year, when we thought when the new pipelines were coming online, the new gas pipelines, I'm going to get my nerve, the Gulf Coast Express, the Permian Highway, or the Permian Express Gulf Coast Highway, um, I thought that those were going to have a, a more, a, a bigger impact on flaring volumes. But as the new, um, as the one that came on last year had a, a you know, it had a little bit of a, of a, of a drip, a, a little bit of a dip. We started seeing flaring volumes crank right back, crank right back up. I thought, man, we've, we've really got to start to understand this data. So we started looking at this. I started looking at this probably September, October, um, maybe earlier than that even, maybe, maybe August, and, and started cranking through all this data. It just took us a few months to put this together. And, uh, and once we had it put together, really wanted to try to get the information out. Follow up from Asher, did anyone in the industry ask you to hold off on undertaking this analysis? Uh, the question was, did anybody ask me to hold off on undertaking this analysis? No, as a matter of fact, uh, well, I, I got a, a lot of um, support. People said, man, this is awesome. We need data. We need to be able to speak to what's really happening as opposed to just talking in a, in a theoretical or philosophical level. So a lot, of, a lot of support for this. Question from Bill Holland. With the increased investor focus on environmental issues, flaring is a sort of a black eye on the industry, deserved or not. Did ESG considerations enter into your thinking, or is that for individual firms to sort out? The question is uh, that with with a, additional focus from Bill Holland, from additional focus uh, on from investor groups on <clears throat> ESG issues, did that figure into my analysis here? It did not. Uh, although I will say, you know, I've heard a lot about that too. In fact, I've heard concerns. So when I talk about who who all has been expressing concerns about flaring, the industry, investor community. Uh, people who live in the Permian Basin, Midland area, uh, general people, uh, you know, environmental groups. I mean, it's really been a pretty broad cross-section. And so one of the things that, that I was, I would say this, I, I did not anticipate that Texas flaring intensity levels were going to be so much lower than the rest of the world and, and particularly other regions. So I think that what, what this helps me think about is, okay, this really, it, it, as we look at this now, is more of a, a global challenge. Texas is really in a position to, to lead as opposed to try to, to, to yeah, there, there's opportunities to reduce flaring here, but since we're already out in front, how, how do we then lead in that and inspire others to, to follow a, a more aggressive pace? And so I, I think, if, if anything, um, and I don't mean to speak for investors, but if you say, well, I want to invest in areas that are leading on ESG issues, it looks like Texas is doing it. Question, several questions from Mike Lee at e and &E. Okay. Um, North Dakota, which also has a widely publicized flaring problem, has set the goal of reducing, and they have from 30 to about 16. Why can't Texas take a similar approach? Well, the first question is, hey, North Dakota has reduced their flaring levels a lot in the last couple of years, sure. And um, in fact, uh, if you're, their, their oil production has remained constant, whereas Texas has grown a lot during that time. Also, um, look, they did it over a matter of years. 
uh, we're the urgency here. If we said, hey, we're willing to wait a matter of years for Texas to reduce its flaring. In fact, I would say this, if Texas was at 30 today and the goal was to get to 16 in a matter of years, I would tell you, I don't have to do anything. That's going to happen by itself. So I think that given the low volumes where Texas already is, the, the rapid growth in Texas oil production, much larger than North Dakota, I think that you have to recognize Texas is in a much different situation than North Dakota is in. Second question from Mike. If Texas had to curtail production to reduce flaring, why would output have to be made up someplace else that flares more? Saudi Arabia's flaring rate is lower than ours, <clears throat> and so are states like Oklahoma and Colorado. Uh, the question was, um, you know, if, if Texas has to curtail output, from Mike Lee asked the question, if Texas has to curtail output, why does it have to come from a level that's higher than ours? I'm not assuming that it, it does, uh, that, that it necessarily comes from a level that's higher or that it comes from an area that's lower. Sure, maybe it all comes from Saudi Arabia. I doubt that. I, I just use the the the, industry, the global industry average of 0.14, right? If we're at 0.09 in the state of Texas, why I, I just use that, assume that the rest of the world produces it at 0.14, that seemed to be a pretty pretty good assumption as opposed to saying, well, maybe it will come from the, the lowest flaring intensity guy, maybe it will come from the highest. Third from Mike, isn't there a way for the U.S. and Texas to be a leader on this problem, e.g. wouldn't Iraq and Iran feel pressure to cut theirs? Isn't there an opportunity? Uh, for instance, if Texas made progress on reducing flaring, wouldn't we be in a better position to ask other countries to cut theirs? So Mike asks, well, Ryan, you know, isn't there an opportunity for us to lead? I mean, if we cut our flaring, then wouldn't we be in a better position to ask other people to do it? Uh, Mike, it, sure. At the end of the day, I don't think anyone's going, I don't think Iran or Iraq are going to reduce flaring because we asked them to. I think at the end of the day, they'll respond to, to buying and what people, what decisions or what what moves people make when they buy crude. They're not, the fact that we reduce flaring here has virtually zero impact on the, the nations who are the highest, who have the highest flaring intensity. Another question from Asher Price. You raise interesting options in your report. Do you favor one of them? And how would you characterize the Railroad Commission's posture for flaring? Yeah, uh, good question. Asher asks, you know, Ryan, you, you list some options here. Do you favor any one of them? No, in fact, my, my goal here was specifically not to try to push one option. It was more to throw out some ideas in the end, I say this in the report, the next step for us is to have a, a public meeting where we bring in folks other than me who say, okay, Ryan, you've looked at this data. Let us look at this data. What other ideas may come up? I don't want to try to preclude that by saying I've got one idea versus the other. So I tried to look at it from a very data perspective and say, here's some options. What does the data tell me about what those would mean? Uh, what was the other part of that question? Um, I don't recall. Okay. I'm sorry, Asher, if there's a part I, I missed, uh, I'll holler back back at me. So we're going to go to an audio question from Joseph Tripke. Okay, Joseph, fire away. Hi, Ryan, can you hear me? I can, yes, sir. Uh, thanks for doing the uh, the webinar. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned, I wanted to follow up on the ESG question and then also your efforts to, to start the public dialogue on this. You know, as you know, being an industry guy, the E&P industry faces some pretty serious funding concerns from Wall Street with the capital discipline trend, etc. But it seems that ESG fund flows are a completely different story. There's a lot of capital looking for zero waste streams and sustainable um, investment opportunities. And it seems like solving this problem, while maybe it doesn't meet the traditional return profile for some, some operators, it seems like that would really fit in this wheelhouse. So is your office doing anything or initiating conversations with some of these sustainable funds um, to, to kind of kickstart their interest in, in getting involved in innovative solutions here? Uh, well, let me say it this way. I'm not, not from a specific perspective of, hey, are we trying, you know, are you guys, are you investing in things to solve this problem? There's been a lot of speculation about creative solutions. Oh, what about, you know, doing a, uh, building small generators on site to turn, to, to, to catch this, this flared gas and turn it into uh, electricity? What about natural gas capture on site as opposed to putting in a pipeline, you know, building the infrastructure to, to capture that gas and, and transport it in another way? And I've had numbers of meetings with different groups, different companies, different uh, investors talking about these sort of things. And, you know, always it comes back to, yeah, those are great ideas, but they don't actually offer a, a, a good economic profile. And so they're, if they're forced, if somebody's forced by government or by regulation to capture the gas, then yes, they'll spend the money, but it's going to be at a large cost relative to pipelines. And so what we find is everyone's saying, look, if you just give us the time, we'll connect the pipelines, rather than spending a much larger portion of our, of our right now it's kind of slim margin on something we may not even be able to afford to do. And so it's a long way of answering, Joseph. Uh, so 
yes, there are there are a lot of people I think looking for those investment ideas. No, I haven't gotten involved specifically to drive them to solve this problem. More, it's been them coming to me, and we've had a lot of discussions, and, and so far haven't seen something bubble up, but maybe something will. Question from Sergio Chapa. Where would the regulatory changes for the options you mentioned take place? Field rules for oil fields known to have associated gas, statewide rules, or others? And Sergio asked the question, where would the, if, okay, if we started to put something here into a regulatory change, where would that happen? Well, it could be both at the statutory level. In other words, there may be, there may be laws that have to change uh, if we're going to begin to regulate flaring differently. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, uh, we have some band, some some width at the Railroad Commission between myself and the other commissioners to make some changes there. In the end, it, it could be field rules. Uh, depends on, on, or it could be just you, uh, rules in terms of how we grant flaring permits. Uh, but all those depend on what changes we would, we believe would be correct. And as I said, at this point, I'm not trying to advocate for any of them. I'm trying to get some data out there to discuss what we think would be the best path forward. And then as, as we start to land on one, one of the discussions will be what are the mechanics of actually putting those changes into effect? Are they regulatory changes, you know, field rule changes, uh, or are they statutory changes? Question from Liam Chambers. Do you think there are areas in the world that Texas can look at as an example to reduce gas without sacrificing oil production? The question is, are there areas in the world that Texas can look at to reduce gas flaring without sacrificing oil production? I think over time, Liam, the answer is yes. And I, in fact, I think Texans and operators that we're talking to are, at, are already doing that. They're trying to figure out how can they plan further in advance? Uh, what, what are the advancements in infrastructure? There's already things that they're doing there. Uh, but in terms of the short term, like something we could do in the next month or the next quarter or even the next year uh, that would have a dramatic effect, I think that's hard to do. I mean, and the, the thing that, that's, I won't say unique to Texas, but is, is Texas is pretty different in terms of the rapid amount of shale oil development that's happened in Texas. So keep in mind that in, in, in Texas, the ratio of our oil, of Texas oil that's being produced through shale wells that have a really rapid decline is, is a higher percentage than anywhere else. Uh, I guess you North Dakota as a percentage, but once again, their, their growth is not as high as ours. But in terms of the volume of oil that Texas has, we're, we're kind of unique. And so that's produced, because of that, there's constant new development to make, even just to maintain oil production levels where they are right now, Texas operators, Texas producers have to continue to drill new wells. And as those new wells are coming online, you need new gas infrastructure. And so there's a it's, a it's a somewhat unique challenge to Texas in terms of the volume, the growth, the percentage that's in complex development, and the existing amount of infrastructure and geology. And so, sure, there's always opportunities to look out there and see what are other people doing. Uh, but I think that the, some of the challenges we face are kind of unique. Sergio Chapo again. A lot of flaring is caused by power failures knocking out processing plants and pipeline compressor stations. Are there any rules for power backups? If not, should there be? Uh, Sergio asked a good question. In fact, one thing that, that we don't cover a lot in this report is some of the flaring levels that we've seen in the last couple of years were due uh, not, not just to infrastructure in terms of pipelines and gathering systems, but there were a couple of incidents at some big gas processing facilities. And one, Sergio mentioned specifically uh, gas, um, uh, I'm sorry, power knockout, and, but there's been other incidents at that, that gas processing facilities. And Sergio asked, well, are there regulatory requirements for power infrastructure at those gas plants? I don't know the answer to that question, Sergio. Uh, and so I can't answer it for you. In fact, talking about gas plants in general, uh, one of the things that I think is, there, in addition to pipelines and gathering facilities, having more gas processing facilities or expanding gas process, processing facilities is coming as well. So back to my option one, which is wait for infrastructure. Part of the reduction we're gonna see is due to a more robust processing facility um, infrastructure. Another one from Mike Lee. What about the idea of requiring operators to pay the state tax on flared gas? Would that give them an incentive to find a solution? Uh, Mike says, well, hey, what about asking operators to pay the, the, the taxes that, on, the, on the flared gas? And uh, the, oh, that's an interesting idea, Mike. It might be one that we discussed. At the end of the day, that's a statutory change. I can't affect that. And so if the lawmakers would want to do that, then that would be, that would be a discussion and it would, we would see, that, we'll see where it goes. Question from Bill Holland. Another way to ask the question which avoids litigation issues, will you be voting against flaring permits for companies that have a gas gathering system available to their wells? Bill Holland asked the question, Ryan, as a question of policy, will you be voting against flaring permits for operators who have a gas gathering system connected to their wells? Bill, I can't answer that unequivocally. It depends on the situation. 
um, you know, everyone knows the, the, the case that, we, that the Railroad Commission heard this year in which a, a, a producer was connected to a, a gathering, gathering uh, facility gathering system. Uh, the challenge was that there was also a question of discrimination in that case, in which we, we recently heard the parallel case about the rate setting mechanism uh, from the pipeline company on that gathering system. And so it would depend on what the what the situation was, whether or not they actually had a contract to use that system, whether or not that system, whether or not there were other extenuating circumstances that meant they couldn't use that system. So I can't answer that unequivocally. Don't have any at the moment. We have several anonymous questions, but we're wanting folks to ask under their name, under their byline. Okay. So look, uh, take any questions anybody has, but we're we're trying to we're we're not going to take the anonymous questions if somebody has um, put them in. We're doing on time. Third one. Okay. From Julian Wettenjell. Okay. The European Union is discussing the climate impact of gas supply from different regions in the world. Are you concerned that Texas LNG supply could have a disadvantage over gas from elsewhere and thus fall victim to possible regulation prohibiting its imports? Can you read the first part again? Read yeah. that again, Brian. The European Union is discussing the climate impact of gas supply from different regions of the world. Are you concerned that Texas LNG supply could have a disadvantage over gas from elsewhere and fall victim to possible regulation? Yeah, so Julian asked a good question. Ryan, are you worried that, look, some of our purchasers of gas is um, uh, around the world? May, are you concerned that they'll look at Texas and say, Texas, you know, you guys are flaring too much, so we're going to stop buying your LNG uh, at current flaring levels. Look, at the end of the day, if they're looking for a market to buy gas, what, what would be the option? To go buy that gas from other places because the rest of the world flares that are rate 50% higher than us? Heck, ask the question this way. What if European Union and other nations said, we're only going to buy gas or oil from nations and regions that flare at least at a flaring level, a flaring intensity level of 0.1 or lower, which is where Texas, te Texas is. I mean, that would reduce flaring levels around the world by, well, it would reduce one third of flaring around the world. So I, I guess, Julian, I'm not that worried about that unless it was more of a political ploy, which then really the numbers don't matter because I think Texas is already leading. And as we, as we see flaring levels continue to go down, Texas may get down to 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. I mean, you get to the point where there's very few places anywhere that are flaring at, a, at an intensity level as low as we are. Question from Jenna Staggs. Do the volumes in the report include venting volumes? Uh, the question is the volume report venting volumes. The short answer is yes, in that casing head gas is is almost all flared. If there's any of it that would be vented, yes, it would it would include that as well. Now, if there's, you know, one thing I'm going to say is there, there's, what this doesn't take into account for is if there's any, any small amounts uh, that might be vented somewhere or, or a leak somewhere or something like that, but you're talking about you know, rounding errors in terms of the total total volumes that have been produced, that have been reported here. Question from Jacob Roberts. How much interest has the RRC seen from the broader Texas legislature for this report? Uh, the question is how much interest have, have I seen from the legislature on this report? Is that the question? Uh, well, look, everyone's seeing this report for the first time today. And so, uh, I haven't had a chance to engage with legislators. I have heard from a few legislators just about concerns about flaring in general, along with everybody else, you know, um, producers, uh, environmental groups, citizen organizations, everybody. So, uh, but nothing specific to this report yet. Question from Mitchell Gordon. Do you believe that this report will inspire the ONG industry to reduce its flaring? Or do you believe that this will give operators the justification to keep flaring at current levels? Uh, the question is, Ryan, do you, do you hope that this report inspires operators to you know, reduce flaring I think it gives them the excuse to do it more. Uh, I very much believe it's going to do the former. In other words, I think it's going to inspire some action uh, to, 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 to flare less. No one I talk to, my, me, people at the Railroad Commission, people in the oil and gas industry, no one believes that current flaring levels are okay. Everyone says, look, we, we need to do things to reduce flaring. I think what this does is this gives us the granularity, and I, when I say us, I mean as a state and, op, and producers, operators as well, to start taking on these issues. And look, uh, I'll just point out, when you ask the question, well, who's the number, from a flaring perspective, who's the number one producer from, of, of the top 150 in the state of Texas? Pioneer Natural Resources. I mean, they, that, I think that that's, get back to the investor idea. If investors say, well, hey, let's flock to Pioneer, EOG, and um, you know, the, the top five, six producers, then 
okay, that there's kind of a self check there. I, I think that this will through through constructive discussion, constructive dialogue will will drive improvement. Question from Benjamin Salisbury. What are some of the technological process solutions that have been proposed to you? Well, some of the technological process solutions that have been proposed to me. As I mentioned some earlier. Uh, hey, Ryan, what about building small gas turbines on wellhead sites to capture the gas, turn it into electricity? Uh, look, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've actually had people who make those units uh, come into the office, and there's some what they call uh, skid units. They bring in a it's already self-contained, plop it down, pipe it up. The problem is most of the, the, the flaring at wellheads is just not of enough volume to make it make sense. And so the economics are really challenging for those. Um, other people have brought in, well, what if we take that gas and, and convert it to something else? I mean, there's a lot of talk these days of, well, turn it into gasoline. Uh, you can use your methane, uh, convert methane into, into gasoline through some process. It's, it's a very hard chemical process, and it's only logical, only makes sense if done on a large scale. Uh, some say, what about just capturing it, you know, building a, a, a capturing facility and, and compressing it and storing it in, uh, in trucks and hauling it off? Well, that would cost more than putting it in pipelines. So those three are, are examples that I've heard, but, but as I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to preclude them. I'm hoping that if something new is developed that really changes the economics, then fantastic. We'll be able to evaluate something different. But today, none of those are, are even close to economical in almost every sense, in almost every situation. Question from Miriam Schulstead. To your knowledge, has New Mexico done similar analysis on their flaring volumes? Have they reached out to you to learn more about your work to do something similar? Uh, Miriam asks, has New Mexico done a similar analysis? Have they reached out to me? No, they haven't. Although, uh, you know, to, it's, it, one of the things that I've, I've noted to myself is I should be talking more with other states, frankly, than I have. Um, I've been focused a lot on what our Texas data tells us because I think we're in a little bit of a unique situation, but still, what are they doing? What lessons can we share? Maybe how can we inspire or lead them? And so, uh, no, to answer your question, I haven't talked to New Mexico. Gia Collier, Texas Tribune. You say you're not advocating for one solution over another, but it certainly seems like you're downplaying flaring as a big problem, or you're arguing that the data show it's not a big problem. Is that a fair characterization? No, Kia. Uh, Kia says that, uh, Ryan, it sure seems like you're trying to downplay that flaring is a challenge or that we need to do something about it, I guess was the point of the question. No, Kia, that's not it at all. I've said that flaring is something that everybody believes, myself included, we need to do something about it. I need to reduce flaring. What I also understand, though, is to take a dramatic approach to trying to, or to, to drive flaring down in the short run could actually have a detrimental effect to CO2 production or total flaring on an international level if we're not thoughtful about it. So all I'm trying to do is say, look, here's the data. And what does that data tell us about what the total global footprint is in terms of flaring? And so therefore we can analyze Texas in the context of all of that, as opposed to simply looking at Texas in a vacuum. Question from Colin Layden. Does the RRC plan to evaluate or look at the NOAA virus satellite data, VIIRS? to help supplement producer reporting data. There are about 100, there are about 400 operators, all small in the Permian, reporting produced gas, but no flared gas volumes. It seems like satellites could be used to verify some of the questions around RC data. Colin asks, are we, should we be using satellites or something like that, I guess, well, but let's use satellite to validate our RC, the, the, the flared data that's being turned into us. Um, and look, I see the, the, the image reports people have, and look, some of those models are, are tough. I mean, you're looking at a lot of, using infrared and, and total heat uh, profile to try to extrapolate the amount of gas that's being flared. And so they're, they're a good indicator, uh, maybe kind of give us an idea if our data is close, but I think that to, to, to use them to validate is really, really hard because it doesn't give us you know, pinpoint solutions or pinpoint numbers as to how much an individual well is flaring or not flaring. So, uh, so, so no, I, well, I think they're a, a, an indicator to tell us if our data, especially since I mentioned earlier, our data is a bit lagging to tell us how our lagging data is relative to today's numbers. I don't think that, they're, that, that the, um, the infrared cameras and the satellite imagery is a good measure to try to check on individual well uh, reports. Question from Richard Brantley. Are you concerned that the slim margins for natural gas and natural gas liquids are limiting the amount of investment and upgrades in gathering and processing facilities. The question was, am I concerned that the slim margins for natural gas are, uh, are, are basically limiting the amount of investment into natural gas, gas gathering facilities? Uh, the fact is that I know it's having a limiting effect. I'm not concerned about it. 
uh, that, that we know that's, that's been a negative impact. However, the interesting side of this is that, that if because natural gas at the wellhead and especially in, in the Permian Basin area is so affordable, so cheap, it, it actually creates an opportunity for midstream companies to capture gas there and bring it to market as opposed to areas of the country where the gas isn't as cheap. So there's kind of a double-edged sword there, uh, or maybe two sides of that coin, but that way. One is, yeah, gas is really cheap. And in fact, the, the, the market for gas on the, on the back end, the consumer price, I think it's $2.10 per MMBTU right now. Man, that's, that's low. Uh, and I don't think it's going to stay there. I think over time, gas prices will come up. And when that happens, that's also going to have a chilling effect on flaring. But, um, but in the short run, yeah, there, I know that the, the folks in the industry are, are from midstream companies to, to, oil, to producers are, are trying to deal with those low gas prices. Another question from Julian Bettengel. In regards to venting volumes, does the report differentiate between venting and flaring? Is that data available? Could you make it available? The question is, does the report differentiate between flaring and venting? No, we don't. Could we make that data available? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. And not that it's, it's that there isn't some of that data available, but whether or not it's not in our data that we gathered, so it's not in my spreadsheet. And um, I'd have to get back and, and in fact, what, what you might do is request that from the Railroad Commission directly, but I'm not, not sure how we would extrapolate that from reports. I have to do a little bit more digging. Another one from Mike Lee, following up on Kia's question. Can you reduce flaring without telling someone no at some point? Mike says, can I reduce flaring without telling somebody no at some point? Well, the, I think the answer is yes, because once again, I think that there is an industry move. One of the other uh, folks on the call asked a question about the, the reduction in investment or the, 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 re, the hesitation in investments into oil and gas in general. And so oil and gas producers uh, are already striving to lower their flaring levels. So that, that a, a new infrastructure, high gas pri higher gas prices, uh, I mean, all these things will contribute to lower flaring levels without us having to say no. Now, that said, if we think, hey, look, you know, we want to hold Texas to a higher standard. We want Texas to go to a flaring intensity level of 0.6, for example, which would be, or 0.06, which would be, you know, nearly one third of the world, then we'd have to start telling people, no, you can't, you can't flare in certain instances to get there. And they would be part of that equation, if you will, to figure out how can they keep from flaring to get their, their flaring intensity levels that high. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying if we want to set, depends on where we want to set the bar. If we want to set the bar at a certain level, then we would only get there by not granting flaring permits. Another one from Liam Chambers, given change will likely be driven by legislation. How do the different parties and or candidates for the federal election affect the regulations surrounding this issue? How do the candidates for federal election affect this, uh, this regulatory change? Because this could be a statutory, it could be something that's handled at a legislature. Frankly, at the federal level, I don't, don't think it has much of an impact uh, because in the end, look, we're, as I've said, Texas is leading on this issue. And so I, I don't see how a, a federal mandate or a federal change would um, would drive any difference in behavior. Now, state legislature, state representative, state senate, uh, certainly uh, the Railroad Commission, I think that's really where, by us working with the folks in our state, our citizens, our, the, the operators in the state, that's really where the solution is going to happen. Question for Mitchell Borden. Do you believe this report will help you in your campaign for re-election of the RRC since flaring is becoming a key issue in the race? Uh, the question is, will this affect my election? I don't really think so. At the end of the day, um, this is not a, a, I'd say it's not a, a red meat issue for a lot of voters. Uh, I think at the end of the day, what the voters expect from Texas is that we have, uh, that we produce the oil and gas. And I mean, as, a, as an industry, as a state, the oil and gas is produced safely and responsibly. And that, um, that, that right now, as I said, there's opportunities to improve in this area, but those improvements, I believe, are going to come. And so I don't think that this will be something that, that affects a lot of people's decisions in terms of who they're going to vote for for Railroad Commission. It's like we have time for one more. Um, folks can send in more questions. So our last question. Yeah. Uh, why does the RSC authorize more flaring than what is authorized by the TCEQ air permits and emission certified for wells? Why does the RRC, say that again, Brian, why does the RRC grant flaring permits in excess of what the TCEQ does? Basically, yeah. 
Why does the R RFC authorize more flaring of MCFDs than what is authorized by the TCEQ air permits and emissions certified for wells? I'm sorry, I can't speak to that issue. I'm not sure. I, I don't have that data in front of me what the TCEQ is doing. So I can't answer that one. Do we, get, do we have any more? Can I take one more? No, that's all the time we have. Okay. Well, we have to go. Thank you very much for spending time with us today. If you have any other questions, you can email them in, uh, and I will try to answer everybody's questions on this issue. Once again, appreciate your time. Texas, I believe across the board, everyone believes that flaring is, uh, is an issue, and it's something that we need to do something about, need to reduce. Uh, I believe that, that operators, the people of this state, um, regulators, we're all aligned in that. And so hopefully this is the start of a discussion, and we will continue that discussion to see improvements made um, over the, the next few months and years. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day.